Fallout has plenty of stories about nations and factions, wealth and corruption, science, progress, civilization building, and genocide. But this is not one of those stories. This is a story about normal people spending their time doing things they enjoy, belonging to a community, and caring for the people they love. This is the story of the Beaver Creek Lanes. Just a short walk south from Far Harbor, we find an abandoned bowling alley called the Beaver Creek Lanes. We can be sent here by the Brotherhood of Steel during some of their radiant quests. Scribe Halen can send you here to search for pre-war technology, and Lancer Knight Captain Kells can send you here to escort a squire on a training mission. The entrance is guarded by a few feral ghouls. Some of them can be legendary and pretty tricky to fight. Just outside the door to the Beaver Creek lanes is a big, derelict bus, where we find a locked explosives crate. This was the parking lot for the bowling alley, and we still find a few cars parked out here. What's interesting about this bowling alley is if you go around back, we see that it's completely covered in dirt, rock, and plants. The earth has formed a ramp allowing us to climb up on top of the roof. There we find a big crane, still engaged in the task of trying to remove a big freight truck and tons of vegetation from a hole in the roof. It looks like there was some sort of landslide. This bowling alley was right next to a steep mountain. Going up the mountain, we find the wind turbines that are near to Acadia. And normally I would think that this landslide happened due to the effects of the nuclear blast, except for the fact that we find a crane here, a pre-war crane, which means the pre-war people were trying to fix this building, or at least dig it out, before the bombs dropped. After killing all the ghouls around here, we can head around back to the entrance, and we see that plywood has been laid down on top of the steps, forming a makeshift ramp. Now, how long has this been here? Why would Wastelanders build a ramp on top of some steps? And if not them, why would the bowling alley owners do it? Heading inside leads us to the lobby of the bowling alley. Here we get attacked by a few feral ghouls, and we hear loud music coming from the kitchen. I found this distracting, so I ran on into the kitchen to turn it off, but I awoke all of the ghouls. The kitchen was booby-trapped with frag mines. In my haste to kill these ghouls, I ran on in, triggering all of them. Since we're already in the kitchen, we might as well explore it. There's a floor safe with an advanced lock in the corner. One of the cash registers is locked with an expert lock, which has some randomized loot. And just outside the kitchen, we find a novice locked door leading to a pantry. A trapper had taken up residence here. We find his dismembered corpse near a cooking station and a sleeping bag. Looks like he fell victim to the feral ghouls. We can loot some ammunition. In the corner, we find a big pile of chairs next to some very strange looking gaming machines. It almost looks like since Bethesda didn't have any pre-made models for pinball machines and arcade machines, that they used the office cubicle slash construction machinery tile sets to just hack together some sort of gaming machine. The pinball machines are particularly atrocious looking. Now there's a ladder leading up to a small platform with a toolbox on it. This is directly beneath a big hole in the wall. Looks like the employees were trying to fix this hole in the wall when the bombs dropped. What was this hole doing there? There's a hallway to the right, but we'll explore that later. I want to go back to this lobby area to explore it first before we move deeper. We can head back up the steps towards where we came in. We find two soda machines, a Nuka Cola and a Vim, but the Vim has an out of order sign on it. Despite this, we can still open the door and loot some Vim Cola inside. There are a slew of pre-war skeletons littering the ground. We see a couple sprawled over a chair by a table near the front desk. Behind the Beaver Creek Lane's front desk, we find the corpse of a woman hunched in a corner. And on a small table, next to where we find a Vault Tech lunchbox, we find a terminal. Here we have two entries. The first is League Standing, Rules, and Schedules. And there we find three entries. The first is Bar Harbor League Rules. And here we learn the League Handicap. What tends to happen in bowling leagues to make sure that everybody can have fun playing with everyone else despite skill level is after you play three games or so, they average your score and then multiply it by a number unique to that league to come up with your handicap. And then what they'll do is they'll add that handicap to your score. 
This means that really good players who have a high score on average are going to get a really low handicap, but poor players who have a low score on average are going to get a much higher handicap. This allows players with widely different skill levels to be able to play on the same team and still have fun. We learned that this particular league's handicap was 220 minus the bowler's average times 0.9, which is pretty standard. We also learned that they are experimenting with a negative handicap at the request of the reigning champion. This is done to give everyone an equal footing and to provide an extra challenge for their top level players. The reigning champion must be really good if he's requesting a negative handicap. In the next entry, we see the 2078 Bar Harbor League standings, and here we get the names of all of the different teams. The reigning team in the league is who gives a split followed by Neander Balls, Ugh. then Holy Rollers, Kingpins, Alley Cats, Unbelievable, Ugh. Scared Splitless, Time to Spare, Pushpins, and Gutter Dusters. Oh, the puns. I just can't handle the puns. They must have thought they were hilarious. And in the final note, we find the bowler scores and handicaps. The record is slightly garbled, especially at the end, but we get a more or less complete list of names. This was a popular bowling alley, lots of people playing games, and the guy who's performing the best is a guy named Thomas Davis. He's the only one with a negative handicap. Here you see that his bowling average is the highest of the list at 244. Because it's so high, he got a negative handicap, bringing him down to 223. The worst bowler on the list is Madison Young. Her average is 98, which means she has a very large handicap at 109. Logan Clark would have the highest handicap at 210, but that entry is slightly garbled, so I don't know if we can trust that. Now, what's interesting about this is we first met Madison Young at the Vim Cola bottling plant. Madison Young was a traitor. She was an employee of Vim Cola, secretly working with agents at Nuka Cola. Nuka Cola dispatched a saboteur to Maine named Aubrey Copeland to infiltrate the Vim Cola company. We even find a secret basement armory that Copeland was using in Far Harbor. We learn from a terminal there that his contact at Vim was Madison Young, and he successfully convinced her to leak to him secrets about the Vim company's upcoming Vim Captain's Blend. Madison chose to betray her company and work with Aubrey Copeland, possibly for monetary reasons, but also because she had a crush on him. In his terminal in his secret basement, we find a note saying that Madison kept asking him to meet her at the Beaver Creek Bowling Alley. And on her terminal at the Vim Cola Company, we see an agenda where she already has plans to meet Aubrey Copeland here at the Bowling Alley. Aubrey Copeland thinks Madison is pretty cute, and so he goes along with her until the job is done. I did a video on this entire espionage drama in my video on the Vim Cola Company, which you can watch here. But we learned from this terminal that Madison Young was not just a casual bowler, but she must have come here quite often. She is part of the league, even if she is the worst player. Next, we can go down to employee memos. And the first one, written in December of 2076, is talking about the Vim machine being out of order. Remember, we saw a big out of order sign on the Vim Cola machine. We learned that the Vim Cola machine inexplicably stops working frequently. This is the fifth time this year that the Vim machine and only the Vim machine has stopped working. The repair guy said that it was because somebody shoved a bunch of bubblegum up into the dollar slot. This can't be a coincidence. This is not only the fifth time this has happened here at the bowling alley, but Jan over at the Bar Harbor Museum said that she was having the same problem with vandalism against her Vim machines. This entry was written by none other than Thomas Davis. Thomas Davis, you'll recall, is the guy who had the best score, even after the negative handicap on the bowling roster. He's more than just a frequent bowler, he is an employee of this establishment, and he really wants the other employees to keep their eyes open for 
any sabotage of this Vim Cola machine. Now you and I know who's responsible. It's likely that either Madison Young herself was sabotaging her company's cola machine, or Aubrey Copeland, when he arrived here at the bowling alley on a date with Madison, would use the opportunity to sabotage the Vim Cola machines. Looks like Nuka Cola is so petty that they'll sabotage cola machines in bowling alleys just to hurt their competitors. In the next paragraph, Tom talks about how he's discovered that one of his co-workers, Mark, accidentally spilled the beans about a surprise party that everyone here at the bowling alley was throwing for him before his deployment. He's been working here at the bowling alley for many years, but he's also been drafted into the military. He's Private First Class Thomas Davis. He doesn't know where the military is sending him yet, but he is on a naval vessel, and his ship will be leaving from Hawaii. He's really proud of his bowling abilities. He even signs this note, 2075 and 76 Bar Harbor Bowling League Champion. And then strangely, at the very end, in really garbled text, he writes, Total ladies man, stop it days, I can write whatever I want, you can't stop me. I get the impression that at the end of this note, he's joking and he's got Daisy looking over his shoulder and as a joke, he's writing about how he thinks he's a ladies man and maybe she's getting upset and trying to pull him away from the computer, which is why he's messing up while typing. I'm guessing that he may have been flirting with Daisy. The next note, written many months later in July of 2077 is, update on Thomas. This was written by Mark Wilson, the assistant manager here, and the man who was throwing Thomas his going away party. He just got off the phone with Daisy. Daisy told him that Thomas's destroyer went down in April, just around the time when he stopped sending postcards here to the bowling alley. He was missing in action until about two weeks ago, but they couldn't contact Daisy or the people here at the bowling alley until they had contacted Thomas's parents. The good news is he's alive. He's not dead, and they're sending him home this week with some sort of medal for bravery and honorable service. But the bad news is that while the ship was sinking, Thomas suffered some sort of spinal injury. The doctors say he'll probably never walk again, and he may never bowl again either. The news hit Daisy so hard that she's going to be out of work for a few more days. But she tells everyone here at the bowling alley that she thanks them for being here for her. So Daisy and Tom were indeed in a relationship. And Tom got paralyzed while at war. He was so proud of being a bowling league champion. But now he'll never bowl again. Three months later, in October of 2077, we see a note, Dining Area Off Limits. This one's written by Daisy herself, and she sends out a big company intramail saying, Sorry about the mess and commotion in the dining area, everybody. Apparently some sort of mishap happened, which almost injured one of the bowling patrons, Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark didn't get hurt, he was just shook up, and he understood that it was just an accident, so he's decided not to sue. But they're still going to be giving him free bowling, and they're going to be paying for half of his beer tab until further notice. They've got an insurance adjuster coming by to ask some questions and take a look at the hole. She says, just tell him that Matthew and Mark were working on repairing a mechanism from one of the ball returns and it went haywire. Could this hole be the hole in the wall that we saw them trying to repair in the kitchen? In better news, she says, I've gotten word that Thomas will be returning in early December. She and Mark are working on a temporary ramp for his wheelchair until Matthew can get a permanent one installed. That's why there was plywood on the steps outside. It was a temporary wheelchair accessible ramp that she and Mark were building for Tom. She ends by saying, on the plus side, I guess you could call the launcher a success. We may be able to get our league champion back on the lane after all, after a few more tweaks, of course, she says. Ha! Huh. Launcher? Was the object responsible for the hole in the wall a launcher of some sort? But how would this get Tom back on the lanes? The final note, written 13 days later, is about the landslide that we saw evidence of outside. The landslide devastated business here at the Beaver Creek Lanes. A structural engineer came by and said that the building is unsafe, and they don't even know if it can be repaired. Matthew, the manager, is talking with an insurance company, trying to get the insurance company to pay the employee wages until this gets sorted, but the insurance company is fighting him. Instead, he's giving each employee a little extra out of his own pay just to pad their checks a little bit while they all look for more work. Mark, 
Daisy and Matthew are happy to give everybody good references while they're looking for other jobs. And Matthew ends by saying, I don't know how long we're going to be closed, but don't you think we're giving up? We'll even do a fundraiser or something if we have to, and when we reopen, we'll be happy to have any of you back. Oh man, these poor people just keep getting hit with bad luck. First, their star bowler gets drafted, then his ship sinks, and he's paralyzed from the waist down. Then they almost kill Mr. Clark, a bowling alley patron, while building some sort of launcher for Thomas. And finally, a freak landslide happens, completely trashing the bowling alley. We find evidence of this landslide right here in the middle of the bowling alley. That truck we saw on the roof, the one that the crane was trying to pull out, has crashed all all the way into the floor here. Getting closer to explore, we awaken many of the feral ghouls deeper in the building, even some that are upstairs. Well, looks like we have a lot to explore here. Going down the lanes, we see that they've got these big beaver faces at the end of each lane, and then there's a hole in the wall leading into a nearby hallway. Here we find three different paths to go. We can go upstairs, we can go down an eastern hallway, or we can go down a western hallway. Let's start by going down the eastern hallway. Let's first ignite this oil on the ground just so that we don't accidentally ignite it later. At the end of this hallway is a locked door, after picking it, we find that we're back in the lobby. Okay, so this is the employee's only door that we passed when we entered. Heading back, instead of going upstairs, let's go west down this hallway. This brings us to a big double door on the right. After killing a ghoul, we see that we're in a room where they would reset all of the pins. We see some machinery at the end of each of these lanes. Now this part of the building is underground. We even find a feral ghoul crawl in from outside through a window, but we do not see sky out the window. That's because this part is completely covered in earth. There's a fusion generator against the wall with a fusion core inside, and then heading out the door, we see a stairway leading up and a chain door against the wall. Heading over to the chain door, we can unchain it, and this leads us back to the cafeteria section. Since we're here, we can explore the doors to the left, and these lead to the bathrooms. This first bathroom is the men's. We find two skeletons on the floor and a feral ghoul. Heading out and going into the next one, this is the women's bathroom. Not much in here except in one of the stalls, we find a teddy bear with a stack of bubble gum and a janitor holding a plunger trying to flush a bowling pin. Now, if we didn't already know the stories of Aubrey Copeland and Madison Young, I'd say that it was this bear who was responsible for stuffing the gum in the Vim Cola machine. At least that's the impression I think Bethesda would want to give us. A mischievous little bear that comes to life at night, surrounded by all this bubble gum, vandalizing the Vim Cola machine by stuffing gum in the coin slot. But since we do know people that have a motive for vandalizing the Vim Cola machine, I think Copeland and Young are the likely culprits. Now, instead of going Going up this stairway, let's retrace our steps and go up the long stairway that we found near that hole in the wall. Heading up the stairs, this leads us to the attic storage area. We can clearly see this big truck hanging down from the roof. We see lots of branches and vines where nature has tried to crawl into this building. Through the northern door, we find a stairway leading down, which brings us to a door to an office area. Looking left, we see that stairway near the chained door. So we've done a big loop. We are now in that room at the top of the second stairway. In this room is a glowing one. Presumably all that remains of Daisy, Mark, or Matthew. We found a female skeleton behind the counter downstairs. I, I guess that must have been Daisy. This then must be either Matthew or Mark. In his office, we see a terminal and that hole in the wall leading to the kitchen. Now there's a chair in our way, so we can't read this terminal without exiting our power armor. But once we're out, we can access the terminal where we find our first note, no luck with the ball return. This was presumably written by Matthew. And here we learn that he and Mark were trying to come up with a lane return ball launcher. They were trying to use the ball returns, and they tweaked the wheel on the returns to spin at such a speed as to launch the balls. The problem is that the wheel was spinning so fast that it was sanding flat edges into the balls, which threw off the balance of the launcher, making it impractical. He then talked with some old timers in town, a guy named Jacob, who recommended that instead of using the lane returns to create a mobile bowling ball launcher, 
to use a fat man. So they talked to a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy, and they ended up trading a couple tanks of gas for an old military issue fat man. They don't know if what they did to get this fat man is considered legal, but he says, hey, we're only gonna kill pins with it, so what the hell, right? The next one, that was close, details the account of what happened to Mr. Clark. They managed to get the ball launcher working. Now, bowling balls weren't designed to fit in a fat man, so he was having problems getting the balls to fit through the launch tube, but he solved the problem by shaving them down a little bit and putting a fresh coat of wax polish on each of the balls. Now, he says, it's launching those balls wicked fast. The bad news is that they forgot to reduce the tension spring on the first ball they launched, which managed to go right through a wall in the office and landed on a table in the dining area right near Mr. Clark. Knocked him clean out of his chair. So that's why they decided to give Mr. Clark free bowling and to pay half of his beer tab for the foreseeable future. They almost killed him with some sort of makeshift bowling ball launcher that they invented. And in the next line, we learn why they made it. They were planning to give it to Thomas. They're gonna have to outfit every ball they use in the launcher before giving it to him, but they say it shouldn't be too hard to do, and at least this way, he'll be able to bowl with them. We can then use this terminal to unlock a nearby safe, and at the very end, we can eject a holotape. This is the general manager, Mark Wilson's holotape. Gotta record this so I don't forget later. After we closed up for the night, you know, Matt and I split a couple of pictures while cleaning the pin setters. We got to talking about Thomas. I, I just can't believe he's gonna be stuck in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And now, I, you know, he ain't never gonna have the chance, you know, to pull that perfect game he's been so close to. So it's like a quarter of three, and we're shooting the balls back up the return, and checking the motors and all, and we get this, you know, this really good idea. So Thomas's arms still work, so maybe we could use one of them ball returns, but you know, we'll hook it up to a stronger motor, and mount it on a board or something. He could launch the balls out of it, yeah, and down the lane, it'd be like a, like an awesome bowling gun. Mark and Matthew never got to give this bowling ball launcher to Thomas. Daisy never got to see the man she loved again. And Thomas never bowled again. Because we learned from the first terminal that Thomas was scheduled to come back home in December 2077. But we all know that the bombs dropped in October. Mark, Matthew, Daisy, and Thomas all died in that nuclear fire. Leaving the striker here for us to find. The striker is a unique fat man with a 50% chance to cripple the target's legs. And as ammunition, it uses bowling balls. Now, while we were reading that terminal, when we read the entry, that was close, we learned the modified bowling ball schematic. We can now go to any chemistry station and craft the modified bowling ball. Now, we find four of these modified bowling balls right here next to the striker, so we can go right downstairs and take the thing for a spin. It's, uh, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the balls don't do a lot of rolling, which is counterintuitive. Sometimes they will roll and other times they just hit the ground and stick there. It took me a while to get my aim right, but I finally did knock down some of those pins. But the great thing about the striker is you can reuse the bowling balls over and over again. You have to run and go find them after you launch them. You basically have unlimited ammunition. Considering how rare and expensive many nukes are, this is a wonderful alternative to a big guns specced player who wants wants a big old fat man, but can't find any mini nukes. Now, we find eight or so bowling balls in this bowling alley. We can then go back upstairs and conveniently for us, we find both a weapons workbench and a chemistry station. Now, taking a look at the modified bowling ball recipe in a chemistry station, we see that it requires acid and oil to manufacture. Now, I don't have any on my inventory, but this is the room where the modified bowling ball was invented, and sure enough, we find two vials of acid and two cans of oil. This gives us just enough to craft two modified bowling balls. The modified bowling balls show up in the ammo section of your inventory, and even though it makes absolutely no sense, 
thankfully, they have zero weight. But the bowling balls that these modified bowling balls are made from have eight weight each. So it's unrealistic to have a stack of 40 or 50 bowling balls on your inventory at any given time, but at least it makes the weapon viable. The bowling balls once modified don't weigh anything and they are reusable. Now how about combat effectiveness? Well... I don't know, I'm used to doing much more damage with just my regular Gatling laser and my missile launcher. Now my Gatling laser is a two-shot Gatling laser, so it does more damage than typical, but it just seems to me that this doesn't do a whole lot of damage. Also in a real combat scenario, it's tricky to find these bowling balls. You saw me shoot, what, four, four bowling balls or so, and I ran around this swamp and I managed to find two. That means that somewhere out here are two modified bowling balls that either sank or I just couldn't find. Now against larger targets, it's a little bit better for some reason, I'm not sure why. This character is specced into big weapons and this weapon benefits from the big weapons perk. I was able to use this striker bowling ball launcher against a Mirelurk Queen and it did pretty decent damage. But that said, After I got out of vats, Kate was able to finish off 25% of this Mylert Queen's life with the simple Aeternus Gatling laser that I equipped on her. So, it's a fun weapon. I'm so glad that I have it, but I don't think I'm going to be using it as a practical everyday weapon in my regular gameplay. Still, for those who are extremely ammo efficient and ammo conscious, this is a wonderful weapon because the ammunition is reusable. A great place to go for more bowling balls is the General Atomics Galleria. In the Galleria, we find Back Alley Bowling, another bowling alley, and inside, you can loot 45 bowling balls. 45! Way more than we found at Beaver Creek. You can then take these back to your favorite faction's headquarters and use a chemistry station to turn them into modified bowling balls, getting some experience crafting and reducing the weight to zero. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the tragic story of Beaver Creek Lanes. These people really loved each other. They had made for themselves a small little community at that bowling alley. Tom and Daisy found love. Mark cared so much for his employees that he gave them extra money out of his pocket when the insurance company wouldn't pony up. They shared a pastime that they all loved, and they cared for each other when they were hurt. The love and kindness that these people showed to Thomas is truly heartwarming. They didn't care that he was crippled. They were going to do everything they could to welcome this hero home with open arms and make him feel like nothing had changed. He could still bowl with his buddies, even if he has to use a makeshift bowling ball launcher. It's just doubly sad that before they could give him this great gift, before Thomas could learn how much his friends and family loved him, the apocalypse happened, ending all those lives and closing the book to so many stories. But what are your thoughts about the Beaver Creek Lanes? Did you manage to find this story in the terminals when you explored it? Have you managed to use the Striker as a viable weapon in everyday gameplay? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I read through all of your comments and I use your comments as inspiration for my future videos. I publish a new video six days a week on a wide range of Fallout topics spanning all the games. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I've got a t-shirt shop, folks. That's right, if you'd like an Oxhorn or Fallout-inspired t-shirt, you can find a link to my shop in the description below. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.